Welcome to uh, New America uh, online event. Um, I'm Peter Bergen, the Vice President for Global Studies and Fellows. Uh, we're delighted to be hosting David McCloskey uh, and his new book, uh, Damascus Station, which is a novel uh, somewhat based on his own career at the CIA. Uh, the novels received great re reviews, uh, including from General David Petraeus, the best spy novel I have ever read. Not a man who usually... <laughs> gives a lot of great inflation, uh, publishes weekly, uh, a starred review. Um, and uh, David had uh, joined the agency in 2006, uh, left in 2014, spent much of his career either working in the Middle East or uh, on the Middle East. And he's gonna spend uh, a few minutes discussing or laying out kind of the themes of his new book, um, and also discuss a little bit how that intersects with his own career uh, and maybe make some general observations about um, the state of play in the Middle East right now. He and I will then have a, a discussion and uh, we'll then open it up to Q&A um, and I will be um, servicing questions uh, from you, the audience, um, <clears throat> as you go. So please don't hesitate. If you do have a question, uh, drop it into the Q&A uh, function or the chat function. Well, David, so tell us a little bit about, let me let me start with, uh, how, you know, how did you come to write the book? Why did you decide to write a novel um, rather than a nonfiction book? Yeah, so, um, I mean, first off, Peter, thanks for being in discussion with me about this today. This is really exciting. I'm still, uh, I'm an alumnus of two fairly secretive organizations, uh, the CIA and McKinsey. So it still is a, a bit <laughs> surreal to be out, uh, you know, in the wild talking about a book that I've actually published. But uh, it's great to, to be with you today. And, and thanks to New America for hosting this. Um, I uh, so, you know, the novel really came out of my experiences at, at the CIA and um, I joined pretty young. I was, uh, I took my first polygraph, I think when I was 19 years old, I, I was an undergrad intern, which I think is not so well known, um, little kind of feeder program into the agency and, uh, and joined my first summer was the war between Israel and Hezbollah in 2006. The second summer was the run up to um, the Israeli strike on Al-Kabar, the Syrian nuclear reactor. <clears throat> and I was pretty hooked, obviously, after those two experiences. So when I joined full time, uh, I, I mostly did work on Syria. I spent a little bit of time in our counterterrorism center working on a topic that at that point was a pretty hot button issue in the region, which was the flow of foreign fighters from Syria into Iraq um, when we had you know, much greater uh, numbers of troops there. And um, I had a front row seat for um, the Arab Spring and the start of unrest and, and, and protests in, in Syria in early 2011. Um, you know, that experience of watching kind of the first few years of the war, uh, really of the, of, you know, protests devolving into war, I think was a very formative experience for me, not just as an analyst, but as a, as a person. And, you know, I kind of watch the hope and the optimism and, and the sense that, you know, something could be different in Syria, which characterized a lot of the early months in particular of that of that movement shift completely over time into, you know, civil war and really the fragmentation of the state. Um, you know, in the in the intervening period, there are half a million Syrians that are dead. Uh, the UN stopped counting five years ago, so that number is almost certainly too low. Um, you know, uh, the state is broken apart, and watching that was a very emotional and kind of formative experience for me. And it was one that when I finally got around to actually being able to sit down and kind of write. Um, a lot of the book came out of a desire to tell some of those stories through fictional characters, through, you know, to punch windows into all sides of the conflict, which is exceedingly complex and we'll talk more about. Um, and I felt like fiction for me was a way to, um, I think, to work through a lot of those feelings and emotions that just wasn't possible if I had sat down to write a book that was, you know, history or some kind of um, nonfiction, uh, you know, memoir of working on the war, it just wouldn't have let me deal with that in the same way, which is why I went down this route. 
Yeah, and you know, the one of the big problems if you have as a former agency employee is uh, the pre-publication <laughs> review board, which often, you know, I mean, the Nada Bacos who wrote The Targeter, yeah. uh, she it took years for her to get her book published. She, she of course, was the main targeter for Abu Musab al Zakawi. Um, and uh, I, she, I, I'm not half sure how far her case went in courts, but I know that she had a lawyer and it was a messy uh, experience or, or difficult experience. And that's, she's not alone in that. So I'm wondering how your experience was given the fact that you were writing a novel. Yeah, my experience was a lot cleaner than the Nada's, that's for sure. Um, you know, the, the CIA, the, the, the PRB, the Publication Review Board, um, tends for, for very good reasons to look differently on, on fiction than on nonfiction accounts. And, you know, so I had that going for me. Um, I also was, I think, fairly judicious in what I knew I shouldn't include or couldn't include or would be irresponsible to include, um, one. And then two, you know, I, I think when I submitted the manuscript, I must have had closer to 250 to 300 footnotes in there to show where I'd gotten particular pieces of information, you know, not from WikiLeaks, not from unnamed senior U.S. officials, right, but very much from stuff that's out there in the open in academia and field research. And um, so I, I like to think I was somewhat smart about how I went about it. Um, they read the first manuscript, I think, in four or five days and got it done. I, I like to think that was because it was so compelling, but- Well, no, uh, I think it, it, that sounds, I mean, that's a miracle that they read it so quickly. Yeah, so they, 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 actually... they went quickly. And, you know, the the uh, the edits they had, I thought were reasonable. They were not major structural kind of things. They didn't black out a whole chapter. It was easy to do. I, I do think my favorite little tidbit about working with the, the PRB is that they will return the manuscript to you with black highlighter through the stuff that you can't say. So it's got this kind of wonderful Cold War vintage kind of thing going on that's uh, always fun to see something that you wrote on your laptop come back with redacted, you know, black highlighter over top of it. But overall, it was a pretty straightforward experience for me. So you... Um... So when did you, you, you did the undergraduate internship, when did you formally join as, a, as an employee? So I would have formally joined in the summer of 2008 then, right, right, after, I, right after I graduated. So you saw uh, obviously the uprising against Assad and sort of its failure. And um, we recently hosted at New America some of the Syrian opposition uh, leaders and the meeting was uh, you know, all Chatham House rules, so, but I won't get into who said what, but I mean, it was pretty clear to me, uh, and I don't have any expertise on Syria at all. It was a meeting led by Joel Rayburn, who's also at New America, who was a Syria envoy uh, under the Trump administration, that, um, you know, they feel that the, the whole world has sort of decided that the Saad's there to stay, um, and that they, you know, they yeah, obviously they're not happy about it, and the, the, the Caesar Act sanctions aren't being enforced. Uh, and then secondarily, Ben Hubbard in the New York Times had a piece of, about six or seven days ago, making some of the same points, but also, you know, reporting it in such a way that it was very clear that a lot of the Arab states have essentially acquiesced in the idea that Assad is going to just be around for for the foreseeable future. So, do you, a do you think that is the case. B, uh, should that be the case? And C, uh, if not, what should be done about it? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I guess at this point, I've been watching Syria long enough to see a couple of these rotations of, and this one obviously is far more extreme, but there was similar dynamics at play when the, um, the Bush administration tried to isolate the Syrians around you know, their meddling in Lebanon and, and their sort of problematic stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis us in Iraq. And, you know, eventually sort of everyone got tired by that or thought that it was futile and came back around to re-engaging with the Syrians. We're kind of seeing, I think, some seeds of that beginning again. I mean, you know, the Jordanians have opened what appears to be some kind of, not normal, but some kind of dialogue with the Syrians, the Emiratis have done the same thing. You rightly note that 
you know, we're likely to, all signs seem to be pointing to us sort of waiving a lot of the Caesar Act provisions to allow for the export of Egyptian natural gas through Syria to Lebanon. So, you know, I think that what we're seeing is probably the region acknowledging that the Syrian government is the strongest militia. If you, I, I, I think it's actually just kind of easier to think about it as they are the largest and most powerful militia in the country. Um, in some cases, it will make sense to deal with them uh, and they're likely not going anywhere, which I think are all just, you know, realities of the conflict today. Now, where it gets hard for folks like me who have been watching this for a long time, and certainly for those in the Syrian opposition and people who have you know, exper extensive experience on the ground in Syria is that you, know, you really wish this weren't the case. This is a deeply corrupt, thuggish, awful government slash militia. Um, and yet there aren't practical things right now that I think we can do to change, to significantly change behavior, to push for some kind of reasonable political settlement. You know, I think that the, uh, the era when that was possible, uh, maybe earlier in the uprising, has sort of passed us. Uh, and at this point in time, you know, I don't see a particular need right now for the, there's no need for the US to normalize relations with Assad or to engage with him, you know, maybe in any meaningful way, but at the same time, I'm not sure exactly what we get by, you know, preventing Arab partners from doing that. And certainly at this point, we've abandoned all practical uh, energies behind actually achieving some kind of political transition in Syria. So I think what we're seeing is a lot of our Arab partners sort of acknowledging that, you know, that time has passed. And the kind of implosion of Lebanon kind of strengthens his hand. Is that what you're suggesting a little bit? Well, I think in, in the, in, uh, you know, in the specific case of the gas pipeline, it, it does. Um, you know, there's a, uh, the Syrians have drawn typically their sort of regional influence from the geographic proximity that they have to other potentially more important or problematic issues. Um, you know, Lebanon here is one of them just by virtue of being a neighboring state. Uh, you know, we're sort of in a position where do you want to punish the Lebanese for something, you know, to, to maintain the provisions against the Syrians, you sort of get into a self-defeating uh, position there pretty quickly. So I think, you know, it absolutely strengthens their hand here just by virtue of being, you know, sitting in Damascus and still, you know, still being in power. Um, and do you think that uh, there was a, you know, as you know, there was a drone strike against U.S. forces in Syria in the last three, I guess, 48 hours or so? Yeah. Um, I mean, that is almost certainly by an Iranian-backed militia, or I mean, yeah. what's the point of that strike? <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, obviously neither the, the Syrians nor the Iranians want us there. Um, you know, we're, we're effectively one of the major, you know, impediments to them retaking or having the potential to retake parts of the country that they consider to be theirs. Um, so I can't, you know, I, I don't know this, any of the specific kind of tactical thinking behind this type of attack, but certainly, you know, both the, the Syrians and their Iranian backers have a, an interest in over time, um, you know, making it more difficult for our presence to exist there and for sort of uprooting us, pushing us out, reaching some kind of political settlement that, that gets us out. They, they would prefer to slowly unwind the fact that, I mean, the country is effectively cantonized. You know, the yeah, Turks yeah. control part of the North along with their allies. We uh, are occupying part of the Northeast with our allies. There's a um, part of Northwestern Syria and Idlib that's effectively governed by, you know, some uh, uh, Al Qaeda offshoots. So it, it's, it, you know, that are part of the Syrian opposition. So I think for them, this is a part of a kind of longer term program. And by long term, I mean like generational to retake slowly uh, the parts of the country that are outside of their, their control right now. You mentioned Al Qaeda, um, which has obviously gone through a lot of different <laughs> name iterations, but let's just for the sake of argument call it Al Qaeda in Syria. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, how do you score their relative strengths and weaknesses today? And are they simply focused on the local issues? Um, um, there was the Coruscant group back you know, many years ago, which did seem to have an interest in attacking the West. And as far as I can understand it, the Coruscant group essentially got whacked by the United States and was more or less out of business. So, but so how, what is, and, and you know, and, and in addition is the Al Qaeda and Syria affiliate. Uh, I mean, they seem by sticking to these local grievances, maybe that's a better long-term approach, but you know, might that change? Uh, are they stronger, weaker than they were several years ago? What's the state of play? Yeah. Well, I think this is kind of the, um, Evergreen, evergreen debate of Syria CT analysts. I mean, this was, uh, it's probably no secret. I mean, this is something that we would always, we were thinking about, you know, for, for years at Langley with respect to these groups in Syria where, you know, um, it is, I, I guess I'd probably break it into, into kind of two conversations when we talk about Syria though. One is that they're continue to be small, fairly battered, but obviously still problematic, um, you know, Islamic state cells in the center of the country in the desert, largely in unpopulated areas. They've been pushed there by the, um, you know, the SDF. So that that is a, uh, you know, I think our, our continued sort of presence and and the support for the for the SDF and the Kurdish militias that make up its backbone have fairly effectively kind of driven them out of most of the populated areas. But um, you know, those groups maintain a much more sort of uh, I would say global perspective about their target list in general, and uh, are a little bit different from the ones in the in the Northwest. I think that uh, you know um, Hayat Tahrir al Sham HTS, the sort of um, you know, for lack of a, a better word, Al Qaeda, uh, you know, sort of inspired group. There, I mean, I, I honestly don't I don't know the answer to the question right around what's the balance between focusing locally versus having a cell or capability that could do, you know, or conduct transnational attacks. I think, you know, a lot of really good thinking and research has been done on this group, um, you know, in recent, in recent years. And I think there does seem to be a general feeling that they're focused locally in terms of how they govern and, and, you know, extract resources from the the part of Idlib that they control. But I do think that it's not, it's certainly not outside the realm of possibility that there could be the development of, or at least the sort of tacit acceptance of, you know, a much more transnationally focused operational capability. And obviously if they control the territory, you know, um, it, uh, that kind of development becomes, you know, potentially more likely. So I, I think, well, I haven't seen anything, at least in the open sources, that would suggest that that's, you know, sort of entrenched today. There, you know, it's certainly not outside the realm of possibility. And, and do, uh, do they the areas of around Idlib that Al Qaeda and Syria controls or manages? Do they do that with kind of the consent of the governed, or is it uh, kind of more or less by fiat or some combination of? I mean, are they? Are they seen as pretty legitimate? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's some combination of, you know, sort of the, the carrot and the stick. What, what I will say is that when a lot of these groups started to ha you know, sort of develop governance and service provision capabilities um, in some of the early phase, earlier phases of the war, um, you know, they, they were viewed in some areas by the locals as fairly legitimate actors that were able to, you know, actually deliver services. The regime in many of these places had stopped doing that. Um, and, you know, they were viewed as sort of an alternative to, you know, what I call more broadly sort of warlord governance that had popped up in many parts of the country. But, um, you know, I think that as with all things in Syria, you know, you ask any particular person about this in any particular place and you get one answer and then you, you know, Go ten blocks down and get a different one. So I think it's it's pretty varied depending on the on the p you know the piece of territory we're talking about. Is the regime still delivering salaries to government employees in these areas controlled by the rebels? I, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. 
so that that was a that was a feature of the conflict that was quite interesting in yeah. some of its earlier phases where they were continuing to like places that were controlled by the rebels there would still be sort of government employees they would still get paid now granted because of the collapsing value of the pound that sort of right. may not have mattered as much but you know I, I tend to think it's not as common today um just yeah. given how cantonized it's become but it, it wouldn't surprise me if it were still happening in some places um so and then with isis what's your take on where they are right now and um obviously we have the al hol uh camp which i think seventy thousand people many of them are women and children i think there have been 70 murders there by it seems by women sort of enforcing isis dictates dictates in, in in some cases so um you know is there a scenario where isis can come back in iraq or syria or are they mostly dumb well i, I mean i would tend to let's take the syrian side of it um i i would tend to think that that probably uh depends to a large degree on on the sort of continued uh robustness of our partners on the ground in in northeastern syria um you know who are the SDF? Oh, oh the, the S, SDF, yeah, and the, and the YPG, the Kurdish militias that, you know, that are really yeah. a backbone. Even though, um, we, I mean, didn't we sort of, to what extent, I mean, we famously sort of abandoned them to the Turks the, in the end of the Trump administration. Was that a, a real thing or was that overblown? I mean, to, uh, why are they still cooperating with us if uh, we kind of pulled the plug on them? Well, I think it was one of those sort of uh, kind of classic, Trumpian uh, foreign policy pronouncements where you sort of pull the plug and then you sort of don't, right. um, you know, so, I mean, we, we, we have a U.S. military presence there that in its, uh, you know, it's not large. I think it's about nine, 900 or so. Uh, and I think it functions in many respects similar to the way that um, our relatively small presence in Afghanistan functioned, which was providing, you know, um, the prospect of close air support, providing sort of uh, you know, capability building, providing a sense that, hey, there's, there's a larger force at play here that's bucking me up that has a psychological impact. Um, and I think that's all very, continues to be very important in the, in the sort of counter-ISIS fight in Syria. But I mean, I think the bottom line answer to your question around their cap ISIS's continued capabilities inside Syria, um, you know, it, it's not zero, but it's, it's gone underground, I think, in a similar manner to the way that um, you know, the, the former AQI did in Iraq when they were beaten back toward the you know, sort of end of the end of the surge where it became much more like a much less like a conventional military force and much more like a clandestine terrorist network that is capable of conducting attacks, but not fully gone, but, you know, not able to control a lot of territory. Well, that that's a very interesting answer, because obviously AQI did come back because it took advantage of this. Eventually, war. yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the right set of circumstances, but but also it, the, right now, those circumstances don't really apply. Right. Because Assad is more or less in control of much of Syria and in Iraq, I guess the Iraqi election was was sufficiently not a disaster so that <laughs> it's not like the country's going to collapse more. If there was an Iraqi civil war, that would be good for these groups. But right. you know, we don't have one right now. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So they, they would feed off of you know, the collapse of Kurdish control in northeastern Syria, or at least its fragmentation, they would feed off of, you know, um, military sort of setbacks for the Syrian regime that reduce its ability to control some of the more populated areas, you know. Um, but I think, you know, right now, I'd, I'd put them more in ISIS, more in the category of, you know, sort of underground terrorist network capable of conducting attacks inside the country. But without a really clean operational safe haven like they had for much of the past, you know, seven, eight years. I want to return to the, your novel, Damascus Station. Talk, talk us through um, kind of what the process was for writing the book uh, and give us a sense of um, kind of the, the key plot points of the book without like, you know. Uh, giving too much away. Without giving too much away. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I think I, in terms of the process, I, uh, well, actually, let me, let me uh, maybe just explain a little bit about, I'll tell you a little bit about what it's about first and then explain 
uh, kind of why why I, and how I wrote it. Um, so it's a it's a spy novel. Uh, obviously, it is set in the early years of the Syrian civil war. So you could kind of think 2011 to 2013, sort of as you go from you know protests on one end to sort of full scale conflict on the other. Um, it is about a CIA case officer, Sam, and his Syrian recruit, Miriam, who uh, break sort of the cardinal rule of espionage or one of them and fall into a, a forbidden relationship. They, uh, they go into Damascus to hunt down the killer of another CIA case officer and uh, really kind of come face to face with a lot of the conflict and the tension and the passion in their own relationship, as well as come face to face with a uh, pretty uh, brutal and interesting pair of Syrian brothers who are in the military and the security services and who are guarding a very kind of dark secret at the heart of the Syrian regime. So it's, it's really, it's a, obviously it's a spy novel. It's about espionage, but it's also about love. It's also about um, what it means to be, or at least I hope uh, readers take away that, you know, it's about what it means to be human in the middle of a very inhuman conflict. Um, and I really wrote it, like I said earlier, to uh, get, or I wanted to get Syria right. I wanted to show the conflict through many different lenses and bring it to life through the eyes of the characters so that you don't feel, I hope, like you're reading a book that's a history book or nonfiction or anything like that, but that you're sort of propelled through the narrative through the eyes of these you know, Syrian characters. Um, I also wanted to show, I think, the like, brutality and inhumanity of the conflict, but at the other end of the spectrum to show a lot of the heroism, the self-sacrifice and the bravery that's characterized um, so many people's response to it. And then I think, you know, two is I wanted to get the CIA right. I mean, uh, Peter, there's so much spy fiction out there that's wonderful and fun. And, you know, the protagonist would be arrested by the third page for, uh, <laughs> you know, doing all kinds of illegal things. So I kind of wanted this book to, uh, you know, it's fiction, but to render authentically the work of the CIA and in particular its case officers um, and to get a little bit closer, I think, to the sort of guts of the place to leave readers with the feeling that they understand the work of the agency and its moral code a little bit better after having read the book. Uh, isn't part of the moral codes, you know, essentially stealing secrets and <laughs> dissembling and lying. And, I mean, it's an interesting, I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, attacking the agency. I'm just saying it's an interesting, uh, um, I mean, you're, you're obliged to do things that would, would not be part of the moral code of the FBI, for instance. For sure. No. And, and I think it's, it's one of the very, uh, interesting paradoxes about the agency. And I think it, it's one of the, it's a reason why the place is so misunderstood in a lot of respects publicly is because, you know, you're exactly right. There is this very widely held perception that, you know, CIA officers are liars and the place is, you know, sort of corrupt. It's highly secretive, maybe, you know, it's highly bungling. And, and I don't say any of what I'm about to say to paper over many of the very real issues with the CIA and with the work of intelligence, but what I do think is that when you look at the work of a case officer, when you look at the work of an analyst, um, you know, you're effectively engaged in the search for truth, really. And the, you know, case officers, just to take an example, because, you know, Sam, the protagonist of my book is a case officer, and, and he talks about this with his fictional chief of station in the book. Um, you know, they have to be people who are of extreme integrity, who are trustworthy, who Langley can trust to send out and, and recruit and meet with assets and come back and report accurately on that meeting. Um, and to give those officers such wide berth, uh, they have to be extremely honest. And I think that, that that paradox of sort of the search for truth and honesty being at the heart of the work, but the place being cloaked in secrecy is kind of an important concept when you're talking about the work of the CIA. Um, and it, it's one I wanted to get across in the book. And what are other, were there other writers that you feel like kind of get the agency correct? Um, even if it's, I mean, I, on a fictional level? Yeah. Uh, I mean, on a, on a fictional level, the, the, the two guys that I really, really love, love reading who I think get the agency um, David Ignatius, I think, does a wonderful job in his books of really 
portraying the work accurately. I mean, I still think to this day that Agents of Innocence, which was, I think, his first novel, is probably the closest thing out there, um, other than my book, of course, to the actual work of a CIA case officer. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. It's very realistic. Um, I also love, there, there's slightly more uh, dramatic and fictionalized, but, you know, Jason Matthews uh, has a one, you know, since sadly uh, deceased, has a wonderful trilogy called the Red Sparrow trilogy, which I think does a similar, you know, similarly he's he's capturing the case the life of a case officer and the work and what it's like to be at the CIA. Um, the, uh, those two guys I think do a wonderful job of really bringing to life the actual CIA. And in terms of TV, uh, you know, my wife and I were enjoying the Bureau. Um, I mean, yeah. were, uh, which obviously is about French, uh, but it seemed to have the ring of truth or maybe it's any so are there other tv or film that you think also kind of there's obviously been a whole raft of zero dark 30s and yeah. homeland and you know um, and then also fowder and the bureau which respectively treat the israeli and french services so are there is other other portrayals of uh intel the intelligence services getting better or worse uh what, what what is there anything on TV? I mean, obviously, TV is probably even more exaggerated in terms of than say a a, a, a novel. But right, is there anything that kind of rings true for you? I so the bureau is great, uh, but you're right; it is about the French. Um, I think you know. I I think there are pieces of different series or movies that that get parts of it right. So I think. Um, like the Americans, right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff in that uh, in that series that's crazy, uh, but a lot of the street trade craft, particularly from a Cold War standpoint, was was pretty good. And and you know they they did it fairly accurately. I mean Joe Weisberg is ex agency, right? So he, there was there's some technical expertise that he brought to that. Um, you know I think the the spy the the Netflix limited series that had Sasha Baron Cohen as um, Eli. Uh, is Ellie Cohen uh, did a very good job of kind of portraying um, the uh, you know some some of the psychology of being you know under this kind of very elaborate cover in a pretty hostile place um, yeah. and then I do think you know the the and it's, it's personally my favorite spy novel is um, John Le Carre's Little Drummer Girl yeah does a great job with the psychology, the, the intimacy, the manipulation that goes into, um, you know, asset recruitment and this really kind of slow burn and the rehearsal around a big operation. So I think a lot of other things in that book that are, you know, completely unrealistic, but he gets the core of that, I think, uh, quite right. So how, what was your process for writing the book? Um, and when did you start? And when did you finish? And do you write in the morning, the evening? Um, yeah. How does that work? You got three kids, I think. <laughs> I do have three kids, uh, and they tend to discourage uh, extended blocks of time where I can sit and write and concentrate. Yeah. And there was also uh, COVID in the middle of this, I presume. And COVID, that's right. I so the 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 sort of uh, germ of the novel goes back to the summer when I left the agency. So back in 2014, I um, I didn't have any kids at the time. And I had a whole summer where I was just sort of in between the agency and, and my consulting job. And so I sat down every day and I started writing and, and um, really found that I enjoyed just, be, you know, sitting there for seven, eight hours, putting words on paper. And I thought, I think like a lot of first time writers probably do, at least I did. When I looked at it, I was like, oh, this is pretty good. You know, maybe someone will be interested in this. And uh, I, I put the manuscript aside um, when I started consulting and then I had an opportunity uh, two years ago to kind of come back and spend more time writing and I dusted it off and looked at it and you know I thought well this is really terrible like this is really awful I mean this is no one no one is going to want to read this buy it take a look at it um, and I but it, you know it was all serious focused and I, I, I still wanted to to write the book and so I got much more serious at that point about writing something that I wanted to write and read. And then on the other hand, you know, other people would want to read it and want to buy it. And those two things don't always 
go together uh, when you're when you're writing. So I, my process was every day I sat down for eight hours from about eight thirty to four thirty, and I would just write. <clears throat> and uh, you know, some days, some days you get a lot down on paper, and you know, you feel like the creativity is really flowing and you're moving. And then other days, it's you know, you're banging your head against the wall or the screen, and it doesn't really work. But I found that it was basically impossible to predict based on the feeling that you get when you sit down at the keyboard, if it's going to be a good day or bad day, like it had no bearing on whether it actually was a good day or a bad day. So you just had to write. And so but, yeah. I just did, I just kind of wrote every day. You know, my part of my process is I get up early and start writing and I, because I sort of feel like, um, I think your unconscious mind when you're sleeping does a lot of writing for you uh, or at least sorting out of problems. And I, and I, I feel like uh, often when you hit the keyboard, it's, uh, at the beginning of the day, that's because you, you you've you have been working on it subconsciously. Is that do you find that to be the case? I do, I do, and and uh, you know it, it's sort of like a trite thing to say, but I I do think that a lot of the aha moments come immediately after, like when you've got space from actually sitting there in front of the keyboard and you're doing something else, but you're to your point, your brain is still working through a problem, whether it's a plot problem or a character problem or whatever it might be. Um, and, and I found that uh, I would sit down every day and the first thing I would do is just longhand, I'd write like three or four pages down in a journal and it would just be what's what's going on in my head. It could be about the book, it could be about other, you know, family stuff, whatever it might be. But that really, I think, did some work to kind of churn out of my brain some of the problem solving that had happened overnight to help facilitate getting it on paper as I wrote later that day. So I, I have written a number of nonfiction books. I've never written a fiction book and I... Uh, I admire you uh, for writing a fiction book because I think, <laughs> um, I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages, I think, with writing fiction. Uh, the advantage, of course, is you can make it up. <laughs> the disadvantage is you have to make it up, too. I mean, so, um, uh, but so in the case, in your case, you wrote the entire manuscript and then found an agent and then a publisher, or what was the process uh, for that? Well, so I was, uh, I think they the general rule that I have heard is like, if you're a first time writer and you're doing fiction, you basically have to have the manuscript done before anyone's going to make a decision on it. Whereas if you are doing nonfiction and you have the right background, you yeah. could get into the commercial process sooner by having a few chapters and an outline. Right. I think that's probably true. Um, I was fortunate enough that through um, some connections my wife had, I, I was in conversation pretty early on with an agent about, you know, here's kind of the concept for the book. Here's a couple chapters. Um, so along the way, he would provide help and encouragement to just kind of, you know, you know steer the process a bit, which is exactly what he, he should be doing. Um, but it's still, I still had to finish the manuscript, you know, and and go through a bunch of revisions uh, with a small group of readers that I had before getting it to the agent who then read it and said, okay, I want to rep this and then eventually taking it to publishers. So I, the whole thing was, and then there was another rewrite after we, uh, after we submitted, and uh, and and the editor that we were working with had some feedback that I thought was reasonable, and then we kind of did another rewrite. So, you know, you get to a point, multiple points along the way, and you think, oh, I'm done, and you know, that's tends to be a delusion. <laughs> yeah, writing is about rewriting, right? That's right. <laughs> it it really it really is. I mean that that first draft, you know, there's the the classic Anne Lamott line about shitty first drafts, and then there's you know, um, I kind of have tended to view it as it, you're like getting all the ingredients down on the counter to figure out what it is you're going to cook. You haven't actually started yet, so you think you have the whole story done. You actually don't. You just have like, you know, I'm cooking Italian food, but it could be ten different things, and you have to work through the passes or the drafts to kind of get the meal cooked appropriately. Uh, that's a good metaphor. Um, so do you have another one in the, in the offing? You... <laughs> I, I, so I do, I have, um, I, uh, I have a follow on to Damascus station outline, um, that continues the story, at least for the characters that survive, but I haven't been working on that. What I've actually been spending my time on is, a um, another one focused on Russia that uh, has a totally different subset of characters. It's in kind of the same universe, but it's, um, it's present day. It's it's focusing on really the kind of next phase of the U.S. Russia spy war and trying to answer the question of what would it look like if 
the CIA got really serious about um, sticking it to Vladimir Putin, which has been a fun topic to explore. So <laughs> I'm uh, most of the way through the first draft on that one um, and, so uh, and just, excited about where it's cool. going. You know, I mean, you mentioned you worked at McKinsey. Are you still there? Are you you're a full time no. writer, or what? What? I am. I am a full time writer right now. Uh, so, I uh, I left McKinsey earlier this year uh, to focus full time on getting the second book done and making sure that I could, you know, uh, give Damascus Station a good shot once it got out in the wild. So I've been. It's uh. It's been. It's been a lot of fun to to just focus on the writing. So on your on your Putin book, you, that is not what you focused on, uh, right? At the so what's what's the process in terms of homework? Yeah, <laughs> a lot more a lot more homework, I would say. Uh, I think I probably underestimated how much of the serious stuff I just had in my head as I was right. writing that one. So, you know, I've um, I've read just dozens and dozens and dozens of Russia books. Um, you know, I'm finding, uh, you know former agency folks with experience on Russia who can help talk through some of this stuff with me, uh, yeah. Russians, you know, like really anyone that um, has some bit of information in their head that, you know, has been helpful for the book I've, I'm talking to. There's a uh, extensive sort of uh, plot that involves um, uh, basically cybercrime against a bank and cryptocurrency. And so I'm having a lot of technical conversations about that. So the number of topics that you have to do research on as you write one of these things, they just quickly proliferate. So it's been a much more extensive, I, I've had to do a lot more homework to, to make this one, I think, feel as, as real as an, and, and as authentic, hopefully, as, as Damascus Station feels. I'm just going to uh, remind people if they have a question to drop it in the Q&A uh, document. Um, okay. And so the, the Damascus Station was published, it came out. Uh, what was it October? Well, what was the pub date? Okay. Uh, October 5th. October 5th. Um, and have any of your colleagues read it? Yes. Uh, a number of, a number of them have. A number of them read it um, you know, before it before it came out. Um, and uh, I would say the reaction has been very good. Um, you know, both to getting the serious stuff, you know, right. And and I, I did, I did, you know, I wasn't a case officer, I was an analyst, uh, but I like to think that I've observed them in their natural habitat for a long period of time. And I had a number of them who were advisors on the book who read early versions of the book and, and who have read it since it came out. And I think the, the feedback on, on kind of capturing the tradecraft and the experience has been, has been positive so far. And you mentioned you were tracking the, the foreign fighters. Do you see I mean, uh, you also mentioned Afghanistan. We had the yeah. was the drawdown. Um, is it possible? I mean, you know, I'm reminded of the summer of 2014 um, when I see what's going on in Afghanistan. But it, you know, history doesn't repeat itself. It can sometimes rhyme. Um, and um, and of course, Afghanistan is in Syria, and Afghanistan is a lot further from. United States and, and Europe, and uh, you know, you can drive from Damascus to Syria. It would be pretty hard to drive from. But you can drive from Damascus to Paris. But you can't drive from uh, Kabul to Paris. Uh, it would, you could, but it would be, yeah, you know, it's it's a lot harder. Might not make it. <laughs> anyway, so and you saying you wouldn't probably go through Iran. So, um, I guess that's, my question is, you know, what 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 do you think the likely outcome is? So obviously, we've got this new Taliban government, uh, the first round of appointments were kind of Taliban 1.0, was not a 2.0. Uh, they were, you know, one of them is actually Sarah Khani, as you know, is UN described as being on the leadership council of Al-Qaeda. Um, and so, you know, uh, what, what, what could develop there? And I'm not talking about, you know, a month from now, I'm talking like two or three years down the road when everybody's had time to kind of, uh, dig into whatever position they're going to dig into how do you see it kind of playing out yeah well i you know it seems unlike it seems unlikely to me that in the near term the taliban controls the whole place so you are just as a starting point there you kind of have some of the grist or fodder for 
variety of different actors, some of whom that they may sort of tacit, the Taliban may tacitly accept, some of whom they may not, but they don't have the capacity or the willingness to go after them to sort of, you know, take, uh, to, to kind of take root there, right? And I think that's a, that's a sort of real concern. Um, I also think from a, you know, CT perspective, you know, we, we hear a lot of the buzzword over the horizon, but the reality of it is, is that when you don't have a footprint locally and when you don't have basing rights, to my understanding, with any neighboring state, um, you're sort of in a, you know, nasty position of, in order to deliver, in order to uh, disrupt a, uh, you know, any group from, from planning or, or conducting an attack there, your intelligence actually has to be better because you have a longer period of time from, you know, you, you have longer to go to, to yeah. deliver a military capability. So, you know, I, I think that um, while we will still, and, and furthermore, I think there's an open question around whether, you know, future presidents will have sort of the willingness to, to strike um, as well, given that the, you know, the potential civilian casualties could be higher because the intelligence isn't as good um, or as refined. So I, you know, it, it seems to me I would agree with the Taliban 1.0 assessment. I haven't seen anything to suggest that there's a, you know, new and better sort of crew in town. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge the fact that our CT capabilities will be degraded by virtue of geography, um, at, at, you know, at minimum. So it, it feels to me like with both of those recipes and the fact that no one entity will control the country and we will not have troops there, um, feels to me like you're right. It's not, you know, you can't drive to Paris, but at the same time, you're probably going to have a festering sort of ungoverned, uh, you know, safe haven for prospective jihadis for you know the foreseeable future agreed um here's an interesting question from audience member anonymous how do you deal with things you know are still classified but are also publicly published <laughs> <laughs> yeah. kind of um, and how I does the prp approach such issues yeah so i think the answer there is very awkwardly uh, yeah. is how that's managed i mean um, let me, so from a PRB standpoint, like, and I, I made this sort of offhanded comment about not citing WikiLeaks, but it's true. I mean, if something is officially classified, but is out in the open, I, as a former CIA officer, am not allowed to use that, um, you know, oh. as, as sort of the proof that, hey, it's already out there. So can't you let me write about this? No, you know, that's not an acceptable answer, even though everyone else has access to that information. Um, and, and when you're talking about something that's widely known, but so classified, you know, it just, you kind of, it, it tends to be a little bit weird and there's really no way around it. Um, there's a number of, which I won't mention, a number of things related to Syria that I'm sure everyone can use their imagination on that are very publicly well known um, and have been cited uh, in, in official memoirs on the part of uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, former defense uh, secretary and, and DCI Panetta that I also cannot comment on uh, and no one, you know, at the agency can comment on, but that are pretty well known and out in, you know, for public consumption. It's, it's a little bit weird. <laughs> yeah. And um, another question, we often hear about the impenetrability of Islamist groups or Western intelligence agencies. Can you comment on that in the Syrian context? Impenetrability. I, um, I mean, I think that from a sort of, uh, human intelligence standpoint, uh, nothing's really impenetrable. I mean, yeah. it's, so I, I'd probably, I, I, I'd probably I, I presume the characterization there, a little bit, but there's, yeah. There's, there's, I guess, I, there must be all degrees, right? I mean, we know, right. um, I mean, we know by name a number of Westerners who penetrated jihadi groups and um so it, it doesn't seem impossible so, but it's obviously a hard target it's probably i remember sure. uh, interviewing a cia uh official long before 9 11 and he was he he said look you know in the, in the old days i could go and have a beer with a palestinian terrorist you know guy yes. but i can't do that with these islamists so i mean he 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 was saying it was was harder but so but you're you're saying it's 
far from impossible. It's not like penetrating Kim Jong Un's inner sure. circle, which I presume well, would be very hard. No, absolutely. And I think what what you find when you start looking really at any group of humans anywhere, <laughs> uh, whether they are you know North Koreans or or Russians or members of Jabhat al Nusra in Syria, like you you realize that there are vulnerabilities um, from a human standpoint. There are there are members of the group who are less ideologically committed. There are members of the group who owe people money and who don't like other people in the group. There are, you know, it's the sort of realities of human nature. You, you have more people, it's a hard target precisely because in those inner sanctums of, of the actual operational commanders and, and the folks who are making the decisions, they are very ideologically committed and very tight-knit communities, but at the same time, they are humans. And so you have the practical vulnerabilities that all humans have um, when you start to look closely at those groups. And so I think from an intelligence standpoint, you know, the agency, um, they're harder for sure, but, but it doesn't mean that there aren't handholds or vulnerabilities that can be exposed and yeah. exploited. Well, um, we're close to um, the end of uh, our allotted time. Is there anything that you'd like to say just in, in wrapping up? Um, well, what I will say is I, you know, everyone should take a look at the book. Uh, I'll put that shameless plug out there. Uh, I do think that the book, you know, um, will appeal to people who, uh, to a pretty wide range of people. I think if you like spy novels and just having fun reading, uh, it, it hopefully does that. And on the other hand, you know, I think that if you're looking for uh, you know, some insider knowledge on Syria and on the agency uh, and, and how that works, you know, you can, you'll get that too. Um, so I think there's a little bit of something for everybody, both from a sort of, you know, pure fiction, you know, let's have fun reading standpoint, and then uh, more of a, you know, maybe nonfiction focused audience. Um, but uh, no, I think, uh, you know, this is, this has been really wonderful, uh, Peter, to be in, in conversation with you. And I hope that folks, you know, do come away from this with some understanding of, uh, you know, the complexities in, in, in Syria and, uh, and an appreciation, I hope, that the conflict there is a lot more than a, you know, sort of bad guys versus good guys thing, although it does have that, for sure. Um, it's a lot, the shades of gray are, are you know, much more common than, than the black and white. David, uh, thank you for, uh, again, the book is Damascus Station. It's uh, received uh, stellar reviews. Good luck with the book tour and uh, we'll sign off and thank you everybody who tuned in to listen to this. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Great to be with you.